Hi guys, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I have to clarify that the talk title in the program is wrong. The talk is called Trailblazer, a new architecture for rails, and not see you on the trail, because I'm not going to talk about hiking. And I have no idea how this title got into the RailsConf program. But anyway, you're here, and that's great. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you started. No, no worries. So um, I have a question before we start the actual talk. It's a serious question. I have a problem with active record. Um, so I have this post class, and I have this comment model. And they have a has and belongs to many uh, has and belongs to many uh, relationship. So a post can have a lot of comments or many comments. And um, my problem is when I create a post. Yeah, the post is um, the post is persistent already. And then I add comments to that post. How do I prevent Active Record from from automatically persisting? the new state of this post, because I don't want this, the comments to be persisted yet. So I have tried this, and it, it um, saves the comments. I've tried this, and it saves the comments. And I've tried this, and it saves the comments. So can anyone here explain how I can prevent active record from saving the comments until I call save? Dot build? But dot build calls dot new internally, doesn't it? The problem is, the problem is, and that's a serious question, guys, <laughs> because we have this problem in Reform that when we set up uh, collections internally and then assign them to the uh, to the collection attribute like comments, it saves the entire uh, the entire object, and I don't want this. So if anyone has an idea how to prevent this, please hit me up after the talk because I'm desperate and I don't want to read through all the active record <laughs> <laughs> documentation. I could just ask Aaron. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Trailblazer. Um, so before I came to Atlanta, I was traveling a little bit um, to conferences. So the last stop before Atlanta was uh, in Vilnius, in, in um, a beautiful, actually that's wrong. Um, I was in Minsk, so that's, that's the wrong Google Maps. I was in Minsk in uh, uh, Belarus. It was a great conference, um, great speakers. Uh, we had a couple of drinks and it was fantastic. <laughs> before that, I was in, uh, here, I, I just confused the, the slides. So before that, I was in Vilnius, that's in Lithuania at the RubyConf. It was a great conference, awesome speakers. Uh, we had a couple of drinks. It was awesome. A couple? Be oh, before that, I was in Poland at uh, the Wroclaw conference. Um, Wroclaw is beautiful. There's uh, churches and cathedrals, or cathedrals and churches. I have no idea what's the difference. It's a beautiful city. It was a great conference, great speakers. Uh, we had a couple of drinks. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Before that, I was in Brazil at the uh, Tropical Ruby Conference. Uh, has anyone here been to Brazil yet? It looks like this. It was, uh, so the, that's, that's a beach, like palms and stuff. Hey, come in. Hello. Don't be shy. I don't bite. <laughs> Um, uh, Brazil, yeah, Tropical RubyConf was an awesome conference. We had a, awesome speakers, had a couple of drinks. It was great. <laughs> Before that, I was in Mexico in Oaxaca. Oh boy, great place! So I gave a, uh, I gave a talk at a at a user group about Trailblazer. This was amazing. The community is incredibly cool. We had some good speeches, had a couple of drinks. I learned how to dance cumbia. <laughs> it was awesome. And before that, I was in Australia because I actually live in Australia. I'm from Germany. That's where the accent comes from. And I'm not going to show you photos of Australia because it's beautiful and you should all come and visit me there. Okay, let's talk about Trailblazer. <coughs> now, let's talk about Rails. We're all doing Rails, right? Yes. <laughs> this is a Rails, Rails con. So, um, Rails is um, a famous web framework, just in case you didn't know. It's famous for its monolithic, oh, sorry, integrated system architecture. <laughs> um, this is a monolith. And this is a service-oriented architecture. Whatever. So Rails comes with a... What are you doing, what are you doing here on my stage, by the way? <laughs> I'm just chilling, dude. Cool. It's all good. Welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. OK, let's get back to Rails. Um, Rails MVC, we all know it. Like it gives us three abstraction layers to implement applications, the so-called model, the so-called controller, and the so-called view. And that's awesome, because um, it is quite a simple setup. A simple um, level of abstraction, so you can get up and running uh, applications within minutes. You can build a block application in I don't know 15 minutes, or what's the what's the 
What was your official selling point of relative? Well, whatever. So you can ten get minutes. ten minutes. Thank you. So you can get up an an application pretty fast. You can you can um, you can implement stuff without thinking too much about encapsulation, about like n n not that nightmare that we had for in Java and all this stuff. So that's actually great in Rails. So you you get it up and running in minutes. The problem is that you only have three abstraction layers, and all your code goes into views, and all your code goes into controllers, and all your code goes into models. And uh, this usually ends up like this. And um, the problem here is that the original selling point of Rails was, hey, let's have conventions and let's have standards. But once the application gets a little bit more complex, you have no idea where to put this code. So one of the major problems in Rails is programmers asking, where do I put this kind of code in Rails? And what ends, so we end up with like huge models, uh, skinny controllers that still have seven levels of indentation and all that kind of stuff, and um, nightmare views with ifs and else and conditionals and all that stuff to make them reusable. So the problem is um, this monolithic um, architecture, for me, is not enough. This is the monolith that David showed in his awesome keynote. I couldn't find the original photo, so I draw a picture. <laughs> this uh, is a camel on the right-hand side. I think I'm, I mean, come on, I'm, a, I'm an artist, right? I shouldn't talk about coding, I should paint. <laughs> Maybe not. No. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> you already asked me that. <laughs> By the way, if you fall asleep, we have stuff to throw at you, so please stay, uh, bear with me and stay awake. Uh, so the, mono, <laughs> the monolith in Rails. The problem is, I don't have a problem with monolithic architectures at all. Like, I don't want to deploy seven Rails apps when I just want to, when I just want to solve one problem, okay? So, so the thing is, and I think DHH got this wrong, is that a monolith, uh, the, the only, the only um, um, alternative to a monolith is not a microservice architecture. We have, we have um, I, I don't know, like, the monolithic architecture doesn't mean Put all put all your code into um, into one into one um, into one Rails application, and uh, that's it. A monolith can be a service-oriented architecture itself. Like you can have services inside of a monolith. It's just about it's just about abstraction layers. And, and so when I say monolith, I, I'm, I'm talking about one Rails app, but it can be a beautiful, object-oriented, well-destructured architecture in a monolithic application. So please, when we talk about monolith and microservices, don't think of this is a physical app, and this is five physical apps because you can have services in a monolith. And the problem, but the problem here is, I was just talking about having objects and services in a monolith. The problem is in Rails or in the Rails community, when you when you um, when you start adding new abstraction layers to MVC, people automatically um, blame you for being too enterprise or you're over engineering, and this is too many objects. I don't like this. Can't be good. This, this has to be slow because. Objects are really expensive. I mean, every string is an object in Ruby. So, um, yeah, so my problem is um, that Rails used, uh, we say Rails is simple. I mean, that's, every Rails developer says that. Actually, it's easy because simple is subjective and easy is objective or something like that. So uh, I got taught uh, in Lithuania that this is a wrong statement. So Rails is easy. That's every Rails developer. However, Rails is easy. It allows me to structure complex applications easily. That said, no one ever, because it is not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. Um, so what happens in Rails? In a, in a classy Rails, I, I'll just walk you through the, the classy symptoms I've seen in a lot of Rails applications. My job has been refactoring Rails applications for the last 10 years. It was a tough job, a lot of tears, blood, but also tears of joy. So, Let's check out a classic controller in Rails. Um, we got filters that add logic for uh, handling different contexts, for handling authentication, all that kind of stuff. Then we have model code. Every controller action I've seen has a lot of model code, instantiating, creating, I don't know, um, changing attributes. Then we have, um, again, contextual logic deciders. Is, is someone signed in, do this? Is, is someone not signed in, do that? So there's code handling different contexts in, in the controller action. Then we have uh, callback logic, like uh, 
do this if that happened, and after this, do this. So it's like it's it's a it's a load of business logic in, in the controller action. And then we also have rendering code sitting sitting in a controller. I mean, this is a controller action. This is a beautiful controller action. I've seen controller actions with like as I said earlier, seven levels of ifs and else and do this and that. So this is this is what happens because we, we, we chuck in all the code into the controller, or my favorite part, into the model. So in models we have um we have um Configuration for forms. I mean, I know we don't use Azure Accessible anymore, but you know, we, we define fields for forms, and we have uh, accepts and accepts attributes to handle to handle um, form submissions and to handle um, deserialization. But we only have one form per model because we don't have context. And then people add ifs and else to 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 configure that. Oh, I need this form in that context, and I need this form in that context when I'm an admin. So um, I see horrible uh, deciders in, in in active model. And um, <clears throat> also, we have uh, callbacks sitting in the model, callbacks that get triggered, and, and um, <laughs> sometimes they get triggered and you don't want it, and sometimes you want them, but they don't get triggered, and, and you add ifs and else, and it is a nightmare because we collect all code in one, in one asset, in one class. And of course, there's also um, business logic in the model, so everything sits in the model. And uh, I mean, view, I'll just run through that because that's my favorite part of Rails applications. We have helpers and access to models and access to seven levels of uh, attributes of models. And um, we have deciders that decide about the context. And if, if it's an admin, render this. If it's not an admin, render that. So lots of code. And then we have helpers <laughs> that, that are supposed to help. But they usually are a nightmare because you have to, they pass around 200. Wait. There you go. <laughs> it was supposed to hit your head. Not <laughs> he plays baseball. Okay, so helpers. Uh, I, I, helpers never ha help me because what, what I end up is I pass a million uh, variables and objects to, to nested helper calls, and we have, uh, again, deciders to, to decide the context. We have render partial this, pass in locals, do that. It, it, is, it is a nightmare. So when you, when, you look at a, when you look at a classy web application, it doesn't matter if it's Rails or if it's Sinatra or whatever, it boils down to the following requirements that we have per, um, per request. So the first thing is we have to dispatch. We get a request and we have to dispatch. If it, is, it, is it HTML? Do this. Is it JSON? Do that. In case you have a document API, then we usually do authorization. Is it okay to run this request? Is it okay to run this logic? Then we we uh, validate the incoming data. Is it okay? Is it uh, is it all uh, in the this format that I want? Is is uh, the user allowed to run this uh, task and so on? Then we actually run the business logic. So this is where. Um, where you run your, your actual domain code. And then usually stuff gets persisted after, after you run the business logic. And in the end, we render a result. So it's not that hard. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six steps of, um, of things that we handle in a request. But in Rails, the controller handles, uh, I don't know, like parts of that, and then the model renders par uh, handles parts of this uh, stack, and they, uh, they also overlap, so you have model code that should be in the controller, and you have controller code that should be in the model, and then the view does a little bit here and a little bit there, and uh, so, yeah, sometimes it does a little bit more, so, so we have a lot of overlapping code. There's an, it's not clear in Rails, where do I put my code? Where, what's, what's, the, what's the place for this kind of uh, logic? In Trailblazer, which is a cool new framework, um, um, open source, by the way, so you can check it out. And it's got the best book cover ever. Do you recognize people in it? I, I just got taught that this one is DHH. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> so in Trailblazer, we have a, the point of Trailblazer is take these, um, we, we got these six steps of logic in an application, and now take this and structure, give me a structure, help me structuring my Rails application. And uh, basically, this is Trailblazer, so I could just go and leave. So this diagram took me about 10 hours to do. It was a lot of work. Did you have a few drinks? I had a couple of drinks, yeah. A few, yeah. A couple, yeah. <laughs> so um, in Trailblazer, we, have a, we, we introduce a couple of new abstraction layers shown in this diagram. And I'm going to walk you quickly through the, um, through the concepts. After this, we are going to have a live demonstration by my friend. I, what, Jay Austin, how do you pronounce your last name? Huey. Huey. And uh, you're going to learn a little bit about um, how to structure Rails applications using the Trailblazer approach. So as the first thing I mentioned is that the old layers are still there. So we still have controllers, we still have models, and we still have old-fashioned uh, Rails views if you want that. Trailblazer is non-intrusive, so you can use it 
you can use it partially, you don't have to use every layer, and you can use it where you feel you need more abstraction. So you don't have to use Trailblazer across your application. Of course, I would love to see that, but whatever. So in Trailblazer, <coughs> we, got, um, we got the following um, layering. So now it is clearly visible which layer is responsible for which task. So what we do in Trailblazer is we introduce operations. Operations are your business logic. And an operation is not a monolithic beast. An operation internally uses forms, uses representers for uh, uses forms for validation and deserialization. You use representers. You you run your you run your um, manual business logic in an operation. And operations also have access to models. But controllers only access operations, and views only access operations and models. So there is a clear layering in in Trailblazer, which layer is supposed to do what? I have this um, new technique in my talks. Whenever, whenever this slide comes, we do a breathing exercise. It's very simple. So you inhale as much air as possible. You keep it for two seconds and exhale. It's great. <laughs> All right. How does it work? I have no idea. <laughs> um, the controller in Trailblazer ends up as a really, really slim dispatching asset. Yeah? So there's no business logic, no persistence logic, no, no uh, validation, no callbacks in, op uh, in controllers. The controller simply dispatches to the operation. So this ends up with really, really slim controllers. And this is my favorite part. The model in Trailblazer is empty. All the model does in Trailblazer is it defines associations and it defines scopes. So basically, we use tr uh, uh, models the way models were supposed to be. This, this is active record. This is active record by Martin Fowler. Because per definition, and I don't care about definitions of patterns usually, but active record was supposed to be a persistence layer without business logic. And this is what we have in Trailblazer. You can still have business logic in your model if you want that, but per definition, we say don't put it in the model. And we also have views. You can still use Rails views in, in um, Trailblazer. So you can still use um, Hamel and ERB and all that kind of stuff because it's awesome. I don't know. Some people don't like Hamel. Some don't, people don't like ERB, but that's another story. Um, you can still use helpers. You can still use uh, partials, all that stuff. But, but we offer you some, something new. It's called cells. Actually, it's not new. It's 10 years old. It's, um, cells are view models. So view models help you to encapsulate parts or the entire view into objects. We call it a widget in software engineering, and this is what is um, missing in Rails, in the vanilla Rails stack. So a cell, ironically, is called using a helper. Yeah, but all that happens is a dispatch to the cell class. I'm not going to go into the detail of cells, but you have a class that represents a part of your view. And this class can render a partial a view. In cells, we, we, call, we, we call partials views because there is no difference between views and partials because everything is a partial. The partial is logic-less, as I call it. So you still use Hamel, you still use ERB, you can still use helpers, but you only call methods in your view. And the cool thing is, if you call a method like body or avatar, this method is called on the cell instance. So we don't have this problem that we have in Rails with view context anymore because the cell is the view context. So if you, use a, if you call methods in a, in a cell, it's, it's getting called on the, on the instance. It's really, really helpful to replace helpers and to have an object-oriented approach to, in your view. And uh, as you can see, you can still use image tag and URL form and all those great helpers, simple form, whatever, in, in, in cells because that's what makes Rails awesome, the, the, the view helpers that actually help. But we don't have this uh, distinguishing between this is the controller context, this is a view anymore, because everything is just an object. And the brand new thing in Trailblazer is the business logic called operation, the domain layer. And operation is a class. Again, man, so many classes. I don't know where to put all those classes. An operation is, consists of a... Um, a contract to deserialize and validate input and business code. Yeah? So the contract is defined in the operation. 
The contract is just a reform class. If you, I don't, I'm not sure if you know reform. Reform is a form object gem for Rails. And we use reform in Trailblazer to deserialize and validate data without touching the model. So operations always have a form object. The actual business logic happens in one method called process, and that should be the only public method in that class. And in that, in, in that process method, I mean, we, we're probably going to walk through that in the live demo, which is still in preparation. No. 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 Um, so good. Good. <laughs> the business logic, the actual logic you, you, your domain consists of happens in the, in the process method. And um, so you, you, you still access models, you still save models, but um, a lot of work is already done by the operation. For example, validating and assigning the data to the actual model is done in the validate call. If you want that, you don't have to use it. But I like it. Again, what the f Okay, one, two, three. <sighs> I should start doing yoga <laughs> and have a deep professional voice. Okay, so um, the last thing in this introduction is I quickly want to talk about high-level architecture because whenever people ask me what is Trailblazer, I say it is a high-level architecture for, um, for Rails. What is a high-level architecture? Well, a high-level architecture is everything that sits between the request dispatch and the persistence. That is what I call a high-level architecture. This is where Rails le leaves you completely um, clueless because there is no high-level architecture. There's a controller, there's a model, and there's a view. And um, what we have to learn is we have to think in our domain and not in controllers and not in models. So as an example, every application has functions, functions a user can perform. Like you view, a, I don't know why it's a shop, like you view a shop and then you can add a comment to this shop and then you can follow the shop. So stuff, when you click through an application, that's functions, yeah? And in, um, I don't know, in... Domain-driven design, I have never read the book, but apparently this is what we call a use case. And in CQRS, I have no idea what it stands for, but it's great. This is called a command. Yeah? So um, apparently there is existing science about, this, this, about these concepts. So, and in Rails, what we have is use cases and commands get implemented in controller actions a little bit, a little bit in a model, and a little bit in view, and maybe a little bit in your handmade service object, and maybe a little bit in, uh, I don't know, uh, your uh, presenter object, and it's, it is a mess. And when I, when I, people tell me, Rails is so simple, you can hand over a project and the next programmer is gonna understand everything. If this is not true, this is wrong. Like, I've seen lots of Rails projects and every project looks different. I mean, great, I know where the controllers sit, great, I know where the models sit, and I know where the views are, but where's the business logic? How do you structure that kind of stuff? It is a nightmare. And what Trailblazer does is it introduces the operation, so you, you clearly know where is my business logic and what's the structure, because every operation should have the same structure. Validation, deserialization, business logic, callbacks. And um, also, an operation is not just one CRUD thing that has one model, so an operation can have multiple models, and an operation is also not um, a monolithic beast, as I said earlier, an operation is a composition of objects that help you to um, handle your request. And it's, it's an orchestrating uh, instance in your, in, your, um, in your architecture. And the coolest thing about Trailblazer is that um, it has a new file structure. So instead of cluttering uh, files into app controller, blah, 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 app view, blah, 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 app model, blah, 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 you have one blah, blah, blah folder, and it's called a concept. So we structure, in Trailblazer, we structure code into concepts, comment, thing, um, I don't know, um, uh, invoice generation. That's all concepts. And um, all the code goes into that folder that has a couple of um, benefits. For example, if you rename something, you don't have to rename four directories. You only have to rename one directory, but that's only one, <laughs> one benefit. I find it way more intuitive to go through that Directory, you see, okay, we got view models, okay, we got operations, okay, here's my model, okay, here's my, uh, I don't know, like helpers, and it's, and also the views for the view models sit in this directory, so it's it's way more intuitive to 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 grasp what a what a con what a concept is doing in Trailblazer. Yeah, um, Austin, ah, that's you here, right? Yep, yep. Uh, do, you wanna, do you want to do you want to show us some uh, some Trailblazer in action? I, yeah, I can, I can, <laughs> I can do that. But you only got ten minutes. Well, thanks to you, yeah. 
This is really unprofessional. I usually prepare every slide, so I don't have to do this kind of stuff, but he wanted to be part of the talk, so it's all his fault if things go wrong now. Yeah, it's all, yeah sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> all right, guys. So, as Nick said, Trailblazer is actually, uh, it, it sits on top of Rails, um, as we know. It's, uh, the one thing I like about it is that, as he said, you don't have to abandon your typical Rails architecture the, the way that you like doing things. Um, so what I did was I basically built a uh, very simple blog, okay? Because it's a blog. Everybody knows how it works. You know, it's, you know, classic example. So if the thing will do what I want it to do, it's not moving the window. Stupid technology. All right. Uh, Live demos, oh my god. Hey, quiet you. Anyway, um, because I went full screen, I'm an idiot for that. Okay, so awesome, you know, I, bu I built the awesome blog of awesomeness, because yeah. Um, anyway, so the idea, obviously, it's very simple. You know, you just create a blog post. You know, type in information and in title, blah blah blah. And I just, for fun, I just said, you know, this is Markdown enabled. He's extremely proud of this Markdown feature. <laughs> I like it. I like Markdown. It renders on the front end, so and it is, it's implemented in Ruby. Or what? Uh, let's see, anyway, so yeah, just pop my email in here. Anyway, so creates a post, blah, done, grabs your gravatar and all that jazz. Anyway, so that's the, the basic idea that I implemented here. Now, we've all done this in Rails. This is very simple from, you know, perspective of Rails. It's, you know, not a big deal. Um, but uh, in terms of how we did this in Trailblazer, as Nick said, the controllers are really skinny, very tiny, as is the font on this damn thing. I saw you yawning. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, so, okay, big deal here. Post controller, obviously, we have, you know, your index and all this stuff. Um, new, okay, so if I'm gonna create a new, uh, new um, you know, post object, what we're doing here is saying, we're calling this form method on post create. Well, what's this post create nonsense, right? This comes from the concepts directory, and of course, underneath concepts, I've just got post and a file called crud, which create, read, update, delete. So, uh, in here, I'm just requiring trailblazer operation crud. Most of this is documented, by the way, on uh, Nick's uh, blog, for, or excuse me, uh, wiki on the GitHub project for Trailblazer. And in the book that I'm going to mention in a minute. Yeah, yeah. He, he wants you to buy his book. <laughs> buy his book. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so we've got basically, we're just saying, here's, we're subclassing right here. So we've got a post, and here's some active record. We've got a create class, hence form post create. And one thing I have to mention is, just because we reuse the post namespace, which is an active record model class, does not mean that the operation create does know anything about active record. It's just reusing a Ruby namespace. This is a big uh, confusion. There's a lot of confusion in Trailblazer in the community. People think that create now is inherited from active record or something. No, we just reuse a Ruby namespace. So this is how you create namespaces. In a, in, so you can have classes in classes. It's a great right. trick to have uh, readable um, namespaces. Right. And it's good awesome. class inheritance as well. So that kind of brings up a question that I'm, the, the community might have. Given the fact that what you just said, we can namespace it in this way, um, what is the potential in the future for separating Trailblazer from active records? Say I want to swap in another ORM or no ORM at all. What do you think? I mean, is that something on the you know, horizon? What's up with that? Well, Trailblazer is not limited to active record, but in an ideal world, you had a post namespace that's not a model. Then you had your operations in, in that namespace, and, and you had the model that's called, for example, persistence. So you had post, colon, colon, persistence. That's my ideal vision. But in Rails, models are on the global namespace. So that's my trick to reuse this namespace. But ideally, it's in a separate, it's, it's, a, it's, a, names, it's a real namespace, and you have the persistence sitting in, in that namespace. And there then you, you can replace it with um, okay. a, any kind of uh, ORM you want. Right on. OK. Lotus. So, uh, that uh, explanation out of the way here, basically, like I said, you can look over the uh, documentation he's got, but what we're doing here is this is a contract, and this is kind of the meat of, uh, you know, kind of what provides some of the stuff you, you've probably seen, like the validates, for example, usually goes in the model. But in this case, we're telling it, look, you know, you got a property of a title, body, a teaser, which is, you know, a little caption, whatever, author. And of course, in this case, we're doing nested relationships because the post has one author, and the post, or excuse me, the author belongs to a post in uh, terms of active records uh, macros here. So as you can see here, has one author, belongs to post. OK, so we've seen these associations before. Empty models. Exactly, empty models. There's no logic in there. It's, other than that, it's pretty, pretty vanilla. 
So of course we're doing properties here inside this, uh, this block. So what's going on here is this is how we tell uh, the trailblazer that, hey, by the way, you've got this thing called an author, and by the way, it's got these two different properties, name and email. This is what gives us the ability to put this inside the form later, and I'll show you that code in a minute. Of course, here we have validations. I'm just validating presence so you don't, you know, fail to fill it out. Now, this is kind of the big, uh, the big deal right here. This process method uh, is going to, uh, as you can see here, it's got this validate block. Uh, it's basically gonna make sure that uh, all your, you know, params that you pass into it are indeed valid. If so, it will call save on it. So that is kind of how we manage the persistence in this case. Um, now, there are a couple of things that, and I'm gonna ask Nick to explain this in a minute. We had to overwrite a few active record uh, methods as well. Uh, we were looking at uh, doing the inherit, or the, um, uh, what do you call it, nesting for the... Yeah, so, so the, the operation doesn't know anything about, I mean, it does know about the structure of the nesting, but the operation does not know how to create uh, for example, how to create an, the nested author of the comment. So you have to provide that manually. I mean, there's ways in Trailblazer that actually implement this f for you, and you can just configure it. But um, in this example, we explicitly create the author to, uh, to have this nested uh, model set up. <clears throat> exactly. So we've had All details explained in the book. Right. So in other words, that's basically we had a, it's a little bit of a trick to get around some stuff with Active Record. Anyway, so that is exactly how that uh, piece works right here. Same thing inside updates. So we're still inside the post class. Or excuse me, we're inside the, uh, yeah, we're inside the, the post class. I'm getting a little confused with my own code here. <laughs> nice throw, buddy. Sorry, nice I'm, throw. I'm an asshole. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say anything, but. <laughs> hey, Hurry up, you get three more minutes. <laughs> Okay, four. Yeah, you're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, so anyhow, we're still inside our, uh, our post class here. We've got a class called update inherits from create, so we can also call an update action on this later if we want to. And I didn't write that inside the actual, you know, the uh, architecture for it, you know, forms and all that jazz, but, you know, you get the idea. So we also had to call setup model here uh, and overwrite it, but it's an empty method in this case. So moving on here, as you can see, the post controller uh, new, so we're just saying form, post create, done. Create, run this operation, post create, do, okay, and I'm just passing it a block. Uh, the block is only executed when, it's, when the validation was successful. So, so that's the only information the operation exposes is I'm, I was run and I was successful or I was not successful. So the controller does not know anything else unless you do that, uh, unless you ex um, extend the operation. Right. It's only true and false. Okay, so anyway, uh, we're basically running this uh, run uh, post create. Uh, I'm terrible at naming variables, so I just call it x. Um, anyway, redirect to x.model. So in other words, this could be, you know, there's no hard coding of, okay, post or, you know, whatever it might, else it might be here. We just call model and that's it. So we've got RESTful route set up in this case, of course. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, return here, I just don't want anything to happen if, uh, you know, this actually works. So uh, as opposed to rendering the new action here. Show, as you can see, is one line. Present, post update. Okay, cool. Uh, the actual update method as well, same thing. Uh, edit, all that stuff. So, and of course, I, like I said, I didn't implement all the different uh, yeah, things so, here. So the point is that the controller really just delegates to the, um, to the operation and handles HTTP specific stuff like redirects because that's not yep. a, a concern of the operation. The operation doesn't know anything about HTTP and the controller doesn't know anything about the business logic. That's the whole point about this um, structuring. Right, so what does that say? What? Yeah. When the update fails, then um, the, the block is not hit, so you don't have this return redirect to. The block is only executed when it's valid. And then the form is re-rendered. Like, j yep. just, in a, just as you do your um, controller actions in Rails. So the, the whole point is the, the block is only executed for successful operations. Exactly. So does, does if this particular thing doesn't work, it's going to be like, oh, well, never mind. I'm not going to bother with this next piece of code. Oh, here we are. Render action new. Okay, done. So we've got the object accessible inside the form or inside the view, and we can then look at the errors on the object, just like uh, Active Record. In fact, I'll show you if I can actually see the screen. Two more minutes, I need to do the wrap up first. Uh, let's see, views, is that? Sorry, I don't even have it mirrored over here for whatever reason. All right. Because um, he's unprofessional. <laughs> why you? All right, so index for posts. All I'm doing is just grabbing the posts, and pretty simple stuff, right? Okay, we've all seen this before. Here is our form. Okay, so I'm just saying if the number of errors objects you know, is better than zero, then uh, yeah, we got problems, blah, blah, blah. We've seen this before. Now in this case, I'm using simple form. Uh, basically, I saw some of uh, Nick's documentation. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna you know, totally rip this code and you know, work with it like that. 
So as you can see, it's very simple uh, compared to existing active record or existing you know, rails. Very uh, much the same thing. You've got your inputs, you've got uh, all this stuff. Now the inheritance fields for author. So of course the form object represent, you know, based on post. And now we have the, uh, the author object off the post and so on. So there's the inheritance. And of course the show is very simple as well. It's just, you know, view code. That's kind of it in a nutshell. There's uh, a few other things, but um, I'm gonna let Nick take this back. Now there's a little bit of uh, configuration you might have to do, much of which is documented. Uh, it's github.com slash apotonic, A-P-O-T-O-N-I-C-K. And then you'll find the Trailblazer repo from you there. You just Google for Trailblazer, Google, Google rocks. Yeah, yeah, you could do that, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So that was awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm just wrapping up in the next two minutes. Um, <clears throat> so um, the thing is we have, as you saw, we, in Trailblazer we have, like, we can have easily have nested setups. So like the nested form we had, you know, we nest the author into a comment and all that kind of stuff. So that's really, really helpful and all based on the reform gem. So you have nested validations as well, cleanly implemented, and oh. <laughs> it's great. You, uh, a lot of things in Trailblazer are based on inheritance. So we, we, we use object orientation the way it was supposed to be. Yeah, so we, so, by the way, inheritance, I didn't know if you know that, but if you can roll your tongue and your sibling can't, then it's not your sibling. But so this is my sister, and apparently, I don't know, maybe you've got different parents. Whatever, let's talk about inheritance. <laughs> um, so um, in Trailblazer, you can uh, operations inherit from, from, from other operations, and you inherit the contract, you inherit the representative, all that kind of stuff is cleanly inherited into the subclasses. And you can also, Trailblazer is made to, makes it really easy to override specific aspects of the inherited stuff, like you can override properties in the contract, or you can, over, you can also override nested uh, attributes in the contract. You can override uh, stuff, uh, configuration from the representer. You can override your business logic. It's just using um, plain Ruby uh, inheritance. And uh, the way callbacks in Trailblazer work is also very, very straightforward. So you remember this uh, validate and then we save the model. So usually this goes into like the comment model in, in, in Rails. In Trailblazer, this goes into the actual pro, uh, validate or process method. So you can call um, callbacks explicitly, or you can use the dispatch, so you define which callbacks to call, and the cool thing is, let's talk again about inheritance, is that, also, I didn't know that, um, like, if you have a gap in your teeth, your siblings are supposed to have a gap as well. I don't have a photo to prove it, but this is also wrong, because my sisters don't have a gap in their teeth. Um, let's talk about inheritance. So, the, really cool thing is, the cool thing is, you can also deactivate um, um, callbacks in inherited in inherited um, operations. For example, in update, I might not want to have the check spelling um, callback to be called, so I just um, skip it. So it's really declarative and simple to override behavior. And uh, so inheritance works with contracts, representers, policies. We also have policies and authentication in Trailblazer. I did not talk about this today, and I'm sorry. And it is also good to inherit configurations. Representers are awesome. They render and pass stuff, so this is helpful for operations when, you, when an operation does handle JSON. Yeah. So the, the internal um, contract can um, build an, a representative, so the representative helps you to work with JSON and all that kind of stuff. So an operation can pass and render JSON as well, if you want that. It's awesome. And um, again, Trailblazer is not a monolithic beast. It is an orchestration of ob objects handling every aspect of your, of your request. And um, people say, we don't need this. We, we do this on our own. I agree, but Trailblazer is an attempt to establish a standard, OK? So we get awesome stuff in Trailblazer, like polymorphic operations and policies and blah, 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 blah. It's, it's great. Check it out. There's an awesome book. It's on leanpub.com slash trailblazer. Leanpub.com slash trailblazer. Leanpub.com slash trailblazer. Or you could Google it. We also got stickers. The cool thing about the stickers, is if you don't like Trailblazer, you just cut it off here, and then you have a free Ruby sticker. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So hey, hit me up. I'll give you a sticker, maybe. And uh, the if cool thing nice. is, um, Engineered sponsored me to come and give this talk. So they basically pay everything. They are awesome. They are really nice. I'm not affiliated with them, but I find it a great thing. And other companies should adopt this to support open source authors because it is great if you can speak at a conference and, and you meet awesome people. And a great company stays behind you and supports you. 
So thank you, Engine Yard. And um, just to wrap up, use Trailblazer. It gives you new abstraction layers. Use operations because they help you structure your business logic. Use all my gems. <laughs> and um, gems. and, <laughs> yes. and um, be nice to each other. Thank you very much. Oh, and buy a book. Good job, Nick. Good job. <laughs>